All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so today I got a comment here from Davy Mule 3 and he says, "M failing to make head of exactly what you're trying to communicate here. Scripture explains scripture. Please present your teaching. Indeed, there are many." there are so many heretics out there but you will easily slip into heresy if you dwell what you are teaching on an already declared biased presentation I suggest you ground your presentation on consistent thematic teaching about man's final cataclysmic events all right <clears throat> okay so I, I appreciate this comment and this uh, suggestion and so I'm gonna try to do that today all right and I agree in the sense that if I'm understanding him correctly like I, I, I don't I don't understand stuff very well right these big words here thematic I don't even know if I'm saying that right you know cataclysmic that's hard for me to say alright yeah, so it's hard for me to understand exactly but if I'm understanding correctly you want me to have a foundation for what I'm teaching alright so um, first of all, the foundation which I'm going to teach is on the Word of God. That's the foundation. The Word of God that is established in heaven and is here on earth in the King James Bible. It is the pure Word of God. That's the foundation. And it's as solid as anything on earth. Now, I'm going to go from Genesis to Revelation and I'm gonna show that this teaching is consistent all throughout the Bible alright and I think that's what Davy Mule 003 is asking me to do alright so <clears throat> if I'm understanding correctly I hope I am that's what he wants me to do Alright, so, and I appreciate all these other comments. Uh, I really do. Um, maybe I'll get to them after this presentation. Okay? So, I'm not going to cover every single thing in the Bible. It, it's so overwhelming. I want to keep this simple so that somebody that's either new or even just. Um, you know, uh, medium, you know, uh, can learn and understand, right? Yeah, so that even at the same time, even the most scholarly expert can view what I'm teaching and not be able to refute one single point. All right. I want to make this easy and clear and uh, there's gonna be no dispute alright so I'm just gonna do it like this I'm gonna go to Genesis 3 Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 John 11 1 Corinthians 15 1 Thessalonians 4 1 Peter 2 or is it 1 2 Peter 3 oh heck I forgot we'll find out here in a second and then uh, Revelation 1 and Revelation 20 so that's going to be this is going to be the foundation and this is going to be the thematic consistent thematic teaching 
All right. I'm sorry, buddy. You can't get up here. All right. So let's start. Let's start here in Genesis, chapter three, verse fifteen. Follow me on this because this is gonna. I'm gonna be saying the same thing. I'm gonna show you that what we're reading is all gonna square up. You bet you, you're gonna. You're looking for trouble. All right, so my cat's trying to jump on the keyboard. There you go. Good move, buddy. Okay. So in Genesis three verse fifteen. Um, first of all, I think it's it's important to understand uh, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of the tree of the Question mark. See, the serpent is getting Eve to doubt the word of God, and of course we see that today. I see that, and it's 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 crazy it's uh, crazy how many people do not believe the Bible that they hold in their hands the serpent tricked them just like he tricked Eve getting Eve to doubt the Word of God so also many 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 people today do not believe the Bible they hold in their hands they do not believe the Word of God what they do is well the Chinese or the English or the you know the the Greek or the Hebrew says this yeah has God said this in English you gotta go to a foreign language which nobody understands and just <laughs> challenge them on you know I mean really you, you could learn uh, modern Greek and they don't even know modern Greek and you could test them on that and say okay well, blah, blah 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 and they won't understand a word you say because they don't understand Greek but yet they're going to Greek to learn what God says they're going to a foreign language they're not going to a Bible they're going to a language that is dead because they don't believe the Bible they hold in their hands that's why they go to a foreign language all right, so I all right. Let's let's read uh, verse fifteen. The the Lord says to the serpent, "I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel." This prophecy right here, this tells us everything, everything, everything from Genesis to Revelation is right here in Genesis 3 verse 15. This describes the world that we're in and this tells us this world is coming to an end. When, uh, uh, where are we at here? In between thy seed and her seed. When her seed bruises the head of the serpent, then will all evil be done away with. All right. Now, let's go to Matthew. Let's go look at this uh, end of the world. Okay, this is what this is talking about make no mistake about it this is telling us this world's coming to an end <clears throat> all right so the world's been established and it's coming to an end and it, you know obviously it's because uh eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's the world that we're in all right we have the knowledge of good and evil and so in other words evil exists all right so God has established this world and given us the opportunity to do it ourselves and we're gonna see even when Adam and Eve were in the garden they failed to do it themselves because they did not listen to God and so here God sets up this world 
and we're gonna see example after example after example of men failing to do it themselves we can't do it ourselves we cannot do anything without God all right and that's evident all throughout the Bible all right so when it talks about her seed it's talking about Jesus the Lord the Christ the Savior of the world all right he's gonna stomp on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever this is what this verse is prophesying and thou shalt bruise his heel he's gonna stomp his foot on the head of the serpent so hard it's gonna bruise his heel now we're all curious I think I'm curious uh, the, the the disciples back in the day of Jesus they were curious and they even asked Jesus plainly what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world the end of the world is when the Savior stomps his foot on the head of the serpent All right, and it's interesting here the very first thing Jesus says is take heed that no man deceive you that's the very first thing he says and then he says for many shall come in my name saying I Jesus am Christ and shall deceive many there's gonna be a lot of people and there are a lot of people right now obviously many people most people that profess to be Christian saying Jesus is Christ they are deceiving many it's getting bad all right it's getting bad so uh, this is obviously <clears throat> uh, the way it's supposed to play out all right this is the way it's supposed to play out so don't freak out all right and shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him though he bear long with them I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the Son of Man cometh shall he find faith on the earth now this is important to understand because when the Son of Man cometh it's the end of the world it's when um, when God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent it's the end of the world remember they ask him they the disciples asked Jesus what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world right And the end of the world is when he comes in the clouds of heaven right it's the end of the world and um, notice here except it says uh, except those days be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the Son of Man comes shall he find faith on the earth that, so obviously obviously word in decline and there are fewer and fewer people saved today than there was yesterday and the day before that and if, if God let things play out the way they are there would come a point to where there would be nobody that was saved why well because of deception because people believe a lie and they don't regard the truth all right so let's get into this a little more when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world the Sun shall be darkened the moon shall not give her light the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken we read this in Mark 13 
as well. It says here the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. It's the end of the world. And in Luke 21, it says, um, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon earth distress of nations with perplexity the seas and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory just like what we read in Luke 18 it's all throughout the Bible Right, when the Son of Man comes, it's the end of the world. All right, make no mistake about it. It's Jesus, and He's coming back just as He promised. Uh, for example, in in uh, John fifteen, I think. Oh, well, in John 15, it says uh, that you, we can't do anything without him, right? In John 14, it says, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is... In direct reference of him coming in the clouds of heaven all right so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world all right remember what I read in Luke 21 men's hearts failing them for fear all right remember what we read in, in Matthew 24 it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn and in Mark 13 um, oh, it doesn't say does it it doesn't say that they're all gonna be mourning but we can put the pieces together and realize hey that's everybody's gonna be freaking out there's gonna be absolutely no doubt whatsoever that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, everybody's gonna know that it's the end of the world. All right. In First Thessalonians, chapter four, it says, "For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout." with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God now this is parallel with what we're reading in Matthew 24 when it says that he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet right great sound of a trumpet when the Lord himself descends from heaven right so then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven right for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God right and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet this is the same moment in time and this goes all the way back to Genesis 3 verse 15 when the serpent is on the earth upon thy belly shalt thou go and then we read of course the son of man coming in heaven right so we got the serpent which represents all evil and we have the son of man which represents all good and the son of man in heaven is gonna stomp his foot on the head of the serpent so hard it's going to bruise his heel and it's going to destroy all evil 
forever. Okay? Alright, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, then is it the end of the world and there's a great separation between the seed of Christ and the seed of the serpent. In other words, the saved and the unsaved. Alright, so real quickly let me go do this here just in case somebody's confused let's see if I can find a verse here now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made he saith not and the seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ and if you be Christ then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise right now it's important to know that there is that separation coming and that separation is on judgment day all right that's important got to establish that when it's the end of the world it's judgment day it's the great day of the Lord. Now in Matthew 13, we get the parable of the wheat and the tares. Right? And the harvest is the end of the world. The harvest is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and the angels gather us together in his barn and the tares are bound in bundles and burned very simple stuff so also is all these examples that I'm giving you from Genesis to Revelation these are all very simple and easy to understand okay all you have to do is number one believe the Bible that you hold in your hands and then just simply connect the dots that's all you have to do. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. It's not confusing. You don't need 20 years of seminary school. All you have to do is believe the Bible that you hold in your hand. In Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple that simple right there that's like uh, dummies like me the Word of God can make a dummy like me wise be not because I'm wise but because the Word of God is full of wisdom all right now Here's one example that we can connect the dot from 1 Thessalonians 4 to Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. All right. And then we connect the dot also to Genesis 3. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, we get a, a lot of really good information here, right? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order Christ the firstfruits afterward they that are Christ at his coming that's very important to understand and you cannot uh, rightly 
teach a doctrine that contradicts that. I Look, I get it. 99.9% .9 of the pastors today that stand behind a pulpit in front of a congregation, they teach something that is contrary to what we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. Doesn't make it true. All right, just because that's the overwhelming um, majority viewpoint, it doesn't make it true. It wouldn't matter if the whole world taught something contrary to this. It would not make it true. The truth is not based on um, popular opinion. It's not. It's not subjective. The truth is the truth and it's going to play out just as the Bible has told us the whole entire time. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. When he comes, it's the end. Pretty simple stuff, right? When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This is directly parallel to what we read in Genesis 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thee between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel till he has put all enemies under his feet all right this is consistent all throughout the bible I'll just give you one example here the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand and tell i make thine enemies thy footstool how is he going to do that? Well, when Jesus comes down from heaven, he's going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever and ever. This was prophesied all throughout the Bible. It's the same thing over and over. It's incredible. All right, and you think about, I don't want to get too much into this, but you think of everything that is talked about in Genesis 3. <coughs> It's incredible. And you know, the serpent, he says, Oh, thou shalt not surely die. Right? Well, they died. Now, I don't want to get into it, but uh, by the serpent, they all die. But through Christ, we are all made alive. Alright? Now, if we scroll down here, In 1 Corinthians 15, there is a mystery that is being shown to us. What is this mystery? Let's read it. We shall not all sleep, but we shall but but we shall be all changed. We shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice this here. The twinkling of the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Now we've heard this before, right? In First Thessalonians four, right, where it says um, with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, here in First Corinthians fifteen. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And then in Matthew 24, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. It's the talking about the same moment in time. Pretty simple. All you have to do is connect the dots. That's it. And you see it. Hey, it's talking about the same moment in time. At the same moment. When this happens, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. And then we are changed at that time. We are lifted up. We are risen up to meet the Lord in the air. 
Remember what we read here earlier in 1 Corinthians 15? Every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. See, he has led the way for us. He has entered into our body, which is the old temple. We are in this temple right now. And Jesus Christ destroyed this temple, and he has rebuilt this temple. And risen to heaven with the promise to return for us all right so when he returns then we will be changed into that new temple that he has already built when he rose from the dead himself so also will we rise from the dead and we will be lifted up to meet him in the air all right that's the mystery that's being talked about here is that we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we shall put on immortality and we shall put on incorruption All right, it's one thing to put on immortality if we are full of corruption but no not only do we put on immortality so also we put on incorruption that means we're going to be perfect physically spiritually everything we're going to be made perfect remember what we read in Genesis 1 when it says let us make man in our image after our likeness so you could say that we are still being made in God's image even today all right just like what we read in John chapter 3 that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit marvel not marvel not that I said unto thee ye must be born again right so this is all part of the process of being created and made in the image of God all right and so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world we are changed we you know we are lifted up and we are gathered in his barn we're up in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet and Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory all right it's pretty amazing stuff pretty simple stuff really let's see uh, what do we got here second Peter chapter 3 um, knowing this first that there should come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust right and so I've used this as a, a sample verse or example that uh, what we have today are people that are teaching doctrines after their own disgusting lust they are imagining a period of time when they're gonna have rule over women and children and they are going they are essentially they're gonna you know have uh, you know tell them what to do right and there's gonna be a thousand what they're teaching basically if they're just being honest a whole bunch of people if they were just straight up honest they teach a thousand years of filthy dirty sex after Jesus comes and that's you've heard me talk about that yeah I've showed a couple of guys who just come out right out and say there's gonna be sex there's gonna be reproduction um, and a population uh, growth you know and all this filthy stuff and the implication is that they are in their glorified bodies and they will be ruling over people that are not in their glorified bodies and they will be reproducing with them having babies and repopulating the earth it's disgusting but it's important in my opinion to point that out and to expose how evil and wicked these guys are it's bad enough that you're teaching to the unsaved you're teaching our children that hey you can wait until after Jesus comes to believe in him when that's not true at all if they wait another day 
If they even wait another minute, it could be too late. The day of salvation is today. It's right now. Don't put it off, man. Uh, if you put it off another minute, it might be too late. Because when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. There is no more time to get saved. All right, so here in Second Peter chapter 3, um, it talks about how the world was destroyed by water, but now is waiting for the judgment to be destroyed by fire. All right. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so... Uh, the day of the Lord the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night right and I could show you uh, many examples you ought to know a lot of this stuff already if you don't already know all of it okay you know that no man knows the day or the hour when Jesus comes he will come as a thief in the night right and just as it was in the days of Noah when they were marrying and given in marriage eating and drinking and the floodwaters came at an hour that they did not know, that they did not expect, and then the flood took them all away, killed them all. So also, when Jesus comes, it'll come in a moment, in a day and an hour, when men do not expect it. And will consume them all. That's why I say it's, again, it's too late to get saved when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven your opportunity for salvation is today you might not get one tomorrow it might be too late all right the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up all right Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness right this is directly parallel with everything that we've read right when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven what happens the Sun shall be darkened the moon shall not give her light the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken it's the same moment in time the coming of the day of God right where the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat right and then afterward there will be a new heavens and a new earth all right very simple stuff isn't it very easy to understand it only gets hard when you start trusting men rather than trusting the Bible that you hold in your hands you ought to know that Bible the King James Bible is directly from God it's not from man it's from God above directly just as God gave Moses two tables of stone written with the finger of God directly so also do we have the Word of God directly from God and you ought to know that and you most certainly ought to believe that because that faith is what opens your eyes and opens your ears and allows you to see and allows you to hear and to know and understand the Word of God that's the key that's the secret just believe it's always been about faith always been about faith okay all right so we're connecting the dots here from Genesis 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Peter chapter 3. Alright, so we know now that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, he was going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever and ever, right? And we pretty much established that as indisputable fact. All right. So, having established that, let's now go to Revelation 20. Because I think this fella is, uh, he shared this comment in reference to Revelation 20. So now remember everything that I just walked you through. We're going to see it again in Revelation 20. Consistent. Not contrary, but consistent. And just as our friend said, consistent thematic teaching. Right? We need to have a consistent thematic teaching. Whatever thematic means. Probably not even saying the word right. Is it a constant theme? Right? Isn't that what we see here? A constant theme from Genesis all the way to Revelation. A constant theme that the end of the world is coming. Right? We see the, the world established in Genesis. And we also see the world coming to an end in Genesis. Right? So, really, this is nothing new that we're reading in Revelation. And you, I, I would argue that if, if all we had was the book of Genesis, and if we were super smart, we could figure everything out that we we're seeing beyond Genesis, including the book of Revelation. But we're not smart, and <laughs> I'm not anyway. Maybe you are. I'm not. But it's helpful to have these visions that John is describing for us that was shown to him by these angels. All right, so let's take a look at one of these visions. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven. All right, so this is a vision, another vision that John is seeing. All right, so... If you don't understand that, <laughs> oh, buddy, God help you. But in Revelation chapter 1, the very first verse, says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Right, in other words, John is going to be shown things by the angel. Right? Oops, let me do that again. So John is going to show us things right, by the angel. So we have many examples of angels showing John visions in the book of Revelation and here we go here's another vision being shown to John by an angel and John even says I saw an angel come down from heaven that's important it really is because there are so many deceivers out there that'll confuse you and try to convince you that this is after a, a consequential or whatever you sub what, what would you call that a sequential uh, you know what it you know <laughs> the liars and deceivers and the ignorant will tell you that this happens after 
Revelation 19. All right. So Revelation 19 happens, and then this happens. But it doesn't say, and then this happens. And in fact, the fact the fact that it says, and I saw an angel, is evidence right there that we're being shown another vision, just like we've been shown all these visions leading up to this point. I I just I don't know. I feel like I'm wasting time, but the, golly, there are so many dumb people out there that are just willingly going to ignore the simplicity of the scripture in order to fit their Hollywood movie and when they do that it contradicts the Word of God and you got all kinds of problems all right number namely you can't have two ends of the world you can't have two returns to the Lord Jesus Christ yeah you <laughs> You can't. It's dumb. All right, so let's. I don't want to. I feel like I go on a rant. Let's continue. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Isn't that interesting? Here in Genesis 3, we read about the old serpent. Right? And the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. All right, so now here in Revelation 20, in this vision that the angel is showing John and John is describing for us, he says, the angel laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So just think about this. If the angel comes down and he bounds Satan for a thousand years, then that would mean before that he was not bound. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's kind of important. You know, common sense or simple logic, it, it, it's it matters. It really does. Um, so if you're not understanding that, then just take a deep breath and relax. Okay. If Satan is bound for a thousand years, that can only mean he was not bound before he was bound. Make sense? Right? Just relax. It's pretty simple stuff. All right? And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Right? You notice that here? He should deceive the nations no more. This would indicate that before he was bound he was deceiving the nations right just relax does that make sense I mean it has to be that way right this is simple logic simple logic there can be no other possibility. It's the only one. That before he was bound, he was deceiving the nations. Well, how would you explain that? Yeah, let me explain it to, for you. It's pretty simple, and you should have already known it. Okay? So let me get into that real quick. Alright, so uh, we know by reading the Old Testament that there was one nation of God. I don't want to get into the whole history here of the Bible. But to put it very simply, we know that in the Old Testament there was one nation of God. Inside that nation were um, was um, you know the children of God and uh, uh, how do I want to say this here? 
and the kingdom of God. Okay, so the kingdom of God was within this one nation. All right, think of this one nation as having boundaries. All right, inside this, the boundaries were the kingdom of God, and uh, they were the people of God. All right, there was the people, and there was God, and they had one God, and it was God. Outside of the boundary were many nations. <clears throat> All right, pretty simple. So outside of the this nation of God were many nations, and those nations were deceived by Satan because they did not have the kingdom of God. They did not have the kingdom of God. The, only inside the borders were the kingdom of God. We read this all throughout the Old Testament, and it's evident when we get into the beginning of the New Testament. And Jesus comes and he changes all that, doesn't he? Right? Jesus comes and he changes all of that. Right? He says, the nation of God shall be taken from you. I'm sorry, he says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Right, so now he's tearing down the borders. So now there's not just one country, one nation of God. Now the borders are down, taken down, and the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's, you should know that. You should know that anybody in the world can be born of God and that the kingdom of God is available to all and it is the will of God that everybody comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously we live in a world of a, it's a cesspool of deception and many people, most people, almost all the people uh, prefer the darkness rather than the light. Right. So, did I make myself clear here? In the Old Testament, we know that there was one nation of God, the children of Israel, which is the children of God. Inside that nation was the kingdom of God. One people, one God. And then Jesus comes along and he he takes down those borders and makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. Right? So when he does that, now, what about those nations outside of the nation of God? Well, they don't exist. They Satan does not have full control over them like he had done before. Jesus tore down the borders and when he tears down the border now Satan is locked up he does not have full control over those nations during this time like he did back then this is important to understand it's real simple I know I, I in my I think anyway it's real simple because we know that that's how it was all throughout the Old Testament now at the end of the thousand years it's the end of the world and at the end of the world Satan is loosed now he can go out and deceive the nations like he had done before he was locked up Simple logic. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath again. Simple logic. Man, just relax. Right? Because he was locked up, and, but there was a time before he was locked up, and now there's a short time after he's locked up. Right? 
So now after he's locked up and he's let go, he can go out and deceive the nations again like he'd done before. Now how is this? Well, remember what we read here in 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians and Matthew, Mark, and Luke? How that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we shall be lifted up in the air? Remember that? So we're up in the air when Satan is loosed. Right? So you want to, however you want to look at this, man. However, no matter how you slice it and dice it, we're going to be lifted up in the air when Jesus comes. And the kingdom of God is going to be up in the air. It's not going to be on the earth anymore. Remember what we read in Genesis 3, verse 15? It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus is up in the air, and he stomps his foot on the head of the serpent. When Jesus returns, we're going to be lifted up in the air with him. And the serpent and his people are going to be down on the ground. And Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent. Right, so when we are lifted up out of this earth, we that are saved, first the dead in Christ, then those of us which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together. We're up in the air with the Lord. And so, just simple logic would say, all right, so all the people on the earth that are left behind are the unsaved people. They do not have the Spirit of God therefore Satan deceives them once again like he had done before he was locked up alright and then what happens Satan gathers them the unsaved people together just as God has gathered us in put us in his barn up in the heaven up in the air so also does Satan gather his people down on the ground and binds them in bundles right they are gathered at our feet and we're up in the air at the end of the world which is at the end of the thousand years and what happens at the end of the world Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet and so when they are gathered at our feet right it says they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city well, where is that beloved city? It's not on earth. Right? And I just showed you. The beloved city cannot be on earth. It can only be up in heaven. Right? Our city is not in this world. It's not of this world. Our city is above. Right? And you think about John 14 if I'm remembering that correctly again John 14 where it says I go and prepare a place for you that's the city in my father's house are many mansions that's the city it's not on earth it's in heaven Galatians 4 but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all right this is not a standalone verse we got to have a thematic jolly jigger whatever thinger a thematic teaching okay and got to have a foundation for what we're teaching right in my father's house are many mansions many mansions which are comprised of a city which that city is above which is free and the mother of us all if I go and prepare a place for you I will come he's gone to prepare a place for us <sighs> simple logic man simple logic
all right so he goes to prepare a place for us and right here the serpent the, the devil the Satan that old dragon or whatever you want to call him he lays hold of the dragon serpent Satan devil same thing and he gets his people he gathers them together and they compass the camp of the Saints about and the camp, the camp of the saints are those of us that are saved. We're up in the air, right? They compass the camp of the saints in the beloved city. That means they're at our feet. And fire came down. So it, the fire doesn't go up. Fire doesn't shoot sideways here. And fire shot sideways here. No. But the fire shot sideways out of... Uh, modern day Jerusalem and they shot their missiles and George Bush stood over no come on man you either believe this or you don't fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured him so we're up in the air you think look well you think this God's gonna send fire down on us that are saved Simple logic, man. Simple logic. We're up in the air when this happens. Right? We read this all throughout the Bible. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Right? The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Fire come down from God out of heaven and devours them simple logic man it was there the whole time I didn't add that this has been here the whole entire time Revelation 3 verse 9 behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet this is in reference to the end of the world when we are lifted up in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet and they're going to be made to know that God loves us behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel the heel of the foot till I make thine enemies thy footstool till he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet right Revelation 20 fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them it's the end of the world right? pretty simple stuff right So as John is seeing this vision, uh, he describes that the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake and fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. All right. So we read this in Revelation 19, so we can connect the dots and conclude that this is talking about the same thing. It's got to be the same moment in time. It's just a different picture of the same. Thing. This helps us to understand this is the same moment in time in the same place. They're thrown in the same place and it's the end of the world. Right? Take a look. There's not two ends of the worlds. If there were two ends of the world, then the first end of the world wouldn't be the end of the world. That's pretty simple stuff, man. So let's go through verse 4. Alright, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Well, hold on a second now. Relax, slow down. Slow down, fella. And I saw thrones. What's he seeing? And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. What you talking about here? UFO aliens? Nope, that's not it. Nephilims? Nope. That's not it either. Who sits on thrones right now? 
do you sit on a throne right now? Well, if you don't, how can you say that you're saved? Well, maybe the reason you're saying you don't sit on throne, a throne right now is because you're not saved. Is that why? Well, how else can you explain it? All right. Revelation 1, verse 6. Jesus has made us kings. Oh, but you're not a king? Okay, well, then apparently you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. How else can you explain it? I mean, that's the only way you can explain it, logically. It's, uh, you know, simple logic, man. If you are not a king of God, then you're not saved. That's There's no way around it, partner. There's no way around it. If we go to Exodus 19, remember what the Lord said to Moses to tell the people of the of Israel he says you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel a kingdom of priests a holy nation we go to 1 Peter chapter 2 it says ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation right go back to Exodus 19 notice here now therefore if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and then in First Peter 2 chosen generation royal priesthood holy nation peculiar people right so in the Old Testament there was one boundary of people one group of people with borders and then Jesus comes and he tears down those borders and makes the kingdom of God a available to whosoever believes in him right so now we are the holy nation of God which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy right the big difference man when Jesus came it was a big deal All right, so we are a king and priest unto God. Right, the Revelation 1, right? Revelation 1, which has made us kings and priests unto God. Again, kingdom of priests, holy nation, right? Royal priesthood, holy nation, right? And now we are kings and priests unto God Revelation 20 and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them what's that mean does that mean you're gonna be transformed into glorified bodies and having filthy dirty sex with those that aren't saved no that's not what that means at all very easy very clear very simple all right deep breath when we are born of God, the judgment of God has been established in us. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. Nothing can ever change that. You, God, no man, nothing. The judgment of God is final you are saved sealed secured sanctified forever 
the judgment of God has already been given to you the moment you are born of the Spirit of God. You shall never die. So those of us that are born of God, we are kings and priests unto God. We sit on thrones and the judgment has already been given to us. All right, and I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, do you right now live and reign with Christ? If Jesus isn't reigning in your life, then you're not saved. But you can't make that claim that you're saved if Christ is not reigning in your life right now. Notice here it says, and they lived. They, talking about us, we live right now. You're alive, aren't you? Right now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I hope so. They lived and reigned with Christ during this thousand years. Right? You know, we noticed here that there's a big difference when Jesus came. He came and changed everything, didn't he? Right? Which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. Right? When the thousand years are finished, it's the end of the world. Right? The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. If we understood 1 Corinthians 15 correctly, that every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ, that is coming. And then comes the end. All right. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So clearly, Jesus is the first resurrection. It's very clear right here every man in his own order Christ the first fruits talking about the resurrection right? you're familiar with all this right and now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept you know about all this right that Jesus rose from the dead he became the first fruits of them that slept Right? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ, that is coming. Simple stuff, man. It's not confusing. This directly parallels what we're reading here in Revelation 20. The rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So, simple logic, those that died live not again. Those that are in Christ, those that sit on thrones, those that are kings and priests unto God, when they die, that they will be resurrected at the end of the thousand years. Right? This is the first resurrection. What is the first resurrection? resurrection who is the first resurrection is that a pretty good question well what's Jesus have to say about that I mean, you either believe him or you don't right right there it is he says I am the resurrection so who do you say is the first resurrection you think Jesus was lying well we're, we'll find out partner we're gonna find out all right, we're going to see who's a liar when he comes in the clouds of heaven. Is he the first resurrection, or are you the first resurrection? All right, isn't that what you're saying? That when you call Jesus a liar, that you're actually the first resurrection? And that there's going to be a second resurrection after you? You're essentially making yourself to be... 
Christ. Right? And you're nullifying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're replacing it with your own resurrection. Isn't that what you're saying? When you say no, the first resurrection isn't Jesus, and that you are you will be the first resurrection. Isn't that what you're saying, right? Think about this. Blessed and holy is he that has part. Are we not partakers, those of us that are born of God? Are we not partakers of his resurrection? Right? Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, that's where they that are Christ, that is coming. Are we not partakers of his resurrection? Well, I am. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. John 11. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and has made us kings and priests unto God. God, right? You are, you are a royal priesthood, right? We are a kingdom of priests, right? They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Well, but you're not a priest of God? But <laughs> how can you say that you're not a priest of God and claim to be saved? You're just a liar. You don't even know the scripture. Now who are you fooling? The only people you're going to fool are those that don't know the Bible. There's no possible way to get around this. Man, there's no possible way. This can only be those of us that are saved. Right now, we that are saved, we are priests of God and of Christ right now. We are a royal priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. We are kings and priests unto God. I mean, it's obvious all throughout the Bible. We are called to preach the gospel to every creature. We are priests. We are a priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. We that are born of God. We are a holy nation unto God. And we reign with Christ right now. All right, so when the thousand years are expired, it's the end of of the world and Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever and ever all right so this verse here that we're reading and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it or him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them this is parallel with what we're reading in Matthew Mark Luke where it talks about the stars shall fall from heaven right the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light and stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken right that's the what's gonna happen at the end of the world right when uh, the elements uh, of the you know the heavens will melt the elements shall melt with fervent heat, right? The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, right? That's when the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, whose face the earth and heaven flood away. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, right? So the judgment of God, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, if you're not already, if you have not already received that judgment, you will be judged according to your works, and that judgment will be death. You'll be thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
All right, so your opportunity to get relief from that judgment is right now, and that is to be born of the Spirit of God, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you put it off another minute, it might be too late. Right? So the judgment for us that are born of God has already been established. All right? And so when Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Okay. So when all of our enemies are destroyed forever. Right. Then. Will we see the new heavens. And the new earth. Right. The new heavens and the new earth. Right. The new heavens and the new earth. And the new heavens and the new earth, right? The new heavens and the new earth. It's it's all the same, by the way. It's not different. N new heavens. It's not different. New earth. It's all the same, right? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. All you have to do is connect the dots, right? And I John, and I John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God remember what we read in John 14 I go and prepare a place for you in my father's house are many mansions and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven right and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new alright Davy Mule I did the best I can man I did my best. That's all I can do. I've tried to share with you the simple truth that is from Genesis to Revelation that speaks of the very same thing consistently all throughout the Bible. Now, I challenge you or anybody to dispute one single thing that I've taught here today and I will put my teaching up against the biggest toughest meanest men on earth against anybody I don't care it doesn't it's really it doesn't matter because what we read it's gonna come true alright you can argue against me but your arguments against God will always fall short all right, so I appreciate that comment, and I hope that I've satisfied your suggestion. All right, have a good day.